ni ronda mit lo to and currently working on uh, yeah logic app start from an okay 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 do it you know it's not working Hi. Right. Right. Um, so, so a quick uh, intro to the session today. So I'll be talking about logic apps, and we already had sessions uh, here where um, people are talked about logic apps, and there are also been sessions around in um, Ignite conference, Build conference, etc. So, so what I would like to do is in this session focus specifically on logic app, and from a Bootstrap point of view, from a Bootstrap capabilities point of view, and then. Uh, show a few things which hopefully uh, is new to you, or even if it's you go through it, uh, it might be a good good time to go over it again. Uh, so the notion of logic apps is it's a platform which helps you to automate business processes, right? It could be anything. You let two applications, two services, uh, talk to each other, and there should be a way to way to communicate. And this is a perfect platform to in, uh, end up automating these processes. And think of essentially as a workflow. So any business process, you have a notion of a trigger which initiates the whole process, and there's a bunch of actions which kind of describe what what is going on in that process. So in the case of triggers, it can either be a, a push trigger. In this case, for example, let's say you're exposing an endpoint in which someone else is going to post data, or uh, it could be a pull trigger. For example, whenever there is a new file in a file share or a new document uploaded to SharePoint library, you want to go ahead and uh, start a business process, uh, you'd be able to go ahead and do that as well. And uh, so then comes the notion of actions. Like this, these indicate the individual set of uh, steps you take as you go through the business process. And think of it as essentially as a web API. Uh, you're exposing an endpoint to which you can go ahead and uh, hit out to. And there are a few advantages of using the API apps, which is um, what we use uh, in the logic apps world. Uh, first, we have gateway support, which, which takes care of auth. So if you're connecting to Facebook, Twitter, or any of the uh, OAuth providers, like be it Salesforce or anything, uh, you get uh, um, authentication out of the box. You don't have to go in and do it yourself. And the other good aspect of uh, going through the API apps platform is that you get the metadata. So if you look at the screenshot here, whenever we do a search on Twitter, it automatically shows uh, that you get a result back which contains your tweet text, retweet, uh, retweet count, et cetera. And this is really useful uh, because when you're working in a business process, you need to have work with structured data and the ability to interoperate between uh, the data from different parts of your business process is crucial to uh, composing the end-to-end -end flow. And uh, so when it comes to BizTalk point of view, there are two aspects to it. Let's say you are, uh, in this example, you're getting data from Twitter. What the Twitter re returns back is fairly uh, deterministic. For example, it's static. Every time do, you do a, uh, a Twitter search, you're going to get the exact same response body based on their API. But there are also cases in, uh, like, this talk in integration scenarios where uh, your response is dynamic. For example, let's say you're writing to SQL, uh, uh, SQL database. Depending on the structure of the table, your response structure will be different. Let's say if I'm inserting into table A, my response structure will be different. If I'm uh, inserting a record into table B, my structure will be different. So in these cases, we need to have the ability to go back and say I'm able to support uh, dynamic metadata as well. And uh, so the way we support metadata is, is through a, a, a standard called Swagger, and it, it's an open source standard. And what it allows is to define the request and response uh, formats of your uh, web API, and that's what we use internally. So we have the support for dynamic Swagger as well. So if you if you're inserting a, an entry into a SQL database or Oracle database or SAP, or uh, let's say Salesforce, uh, you'd be able to go out and generate these structures dynamically. So that way, as a user, when you compose the flow in the design surface, all you see is the data which is relevant to you and not something which you have to go out and um, 
manipulate yourself, right? And, and one one other thing uh, which I'd like to uh, quickly talk about is the notion of basic versus advanced operations. Like when you when you see this uh, the card which is there in the screenshot, you see this uh, dot 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 ellipsis kind of button in the outputs. Uh, so when you're editing, you'll see it in the input as well. So those represent uh, the advanced operations. So whenever you do, for example, let's take the case of Twitter. Whenever you do a, a Twitter search, the things which are most relevant to you are shown to you directly. Like what is the tweet text, what is the re, uh, retweet count, et cetera. But the, the result also shows a bunch of other uh, response metadata. And if you want to go and look at the entire set of results, you can click that ellipsis the dot 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 button, and then you can see the entire result together. And uh, look, the whole notion of the platform existing together and for you to create this compose, uh, composite application uh, depends on how rich the, the marketplace is. And if you look at our marketplace today, you'll just find about any and every SaaS connector out there as well as the traditional LOB applications. So the marketplace is really rich with about 40 or 50 connectors so far. So any of the uh, business process which you want to automate, you should be able to go and do it yourself. And a good aspect about it is that if you don't find any of the SaaS services or the custom LOB um, applications, which is required for your integration scenarios, you can go and build, build one yourself. You can create a custom API app. Uh, we have went ahead and released the SDK version of it. And you can use it to go and uh, Great one year sir. So before I dive deep into uh, like showing demos, because after this it's, it will primarily be a bunch of demos which we walk through. Uh, I want to do a quick comparison. Uh, so if you if you're already known to this talk, I just want to do a quick shout out in terms of uh, what we mean by concepts, right? In this talk, sir, you need to know a bunch of concepts. Like you need to know what a pipeline is, what an orchestration is, what a pipeline component is, etc. So by the time you understand all of these, you are considered a niche developer of sorts where uh, you know what is there in the stock server, but probably a guy who's outside working on .NET or some other technology won't be able to go ahead and uh, correlate on the same terms. And we also had different developer tools and different experiences for each of these. But once you get past that hurdle, then doing integration with the stock is fairly simple, but you do have an initial learning curve, uh, which is important. We try to minimize that in the notion of the stock services, where we introduce the notion of bridges, and again, you need to understand what are XML bridges, EDI bridges, uh, whether you need source and destination, or how do you do the extensibility in a WCF platform versus a non-WCF platform, et cetera. What we are doing right now with Logic Apps is to uh, eradicate the, all those stuff, having the difference of whether you have an adapter runtime or a not, any other runtime. Uh, we have only one notion, which is API apps. And it's true, be it for consumer-facing scenario or enterprise scenario, it's the same. You will find API apps like uh, connectors for like Twitter, Dropbox, et cetera. At the same time, you will find uh, API apps for integration specific functionalities for mediations like uh, XML validator, transform, rules engine, et cetera. So everything works together and your experience for creating an API app is the exact same thing, irrespective of whether we write it or whether uh, you as a uh, customer write it, it is gonna be the same. So the amount of learning curve which is required for this uh, and the amount of uh, previous knowledge which is required to go ahead and get started with the logic apps, it's fairly simple. All you need to know is uh, how to create a web API app and then get going with it. And the neat part about logic apps is all these metadata, be it in terms of how you construct a business flow or what the metadata uh, is, it's actually in JSON format. It's very readable. You can just, if you open the designer and you go to the code view, which I'll show during the demo, uh, what it is is essentially a JSON metadata which describes what your business process is. So uh, I'll do a quick uh, shout out to a marketplace. Uh, if you go to portal.azure.com and then go to a marketplace and search for API app, you'll find a whole bunch of um, connectors which uh, helps you connect to almost every SaaS service out there. And, uh, uh, not only Microsoft services, but also third-party services. Uh, and at the same time, we also have uh, API apps, which are specific to BizTalk. And I, I wanted to specifically talk about it because previously uh, in BizTalk server or BizTalk services, we are known to having concepts saying that, 
I have a pipeline, I have an orchestration which does that. I, I wrote a Python component which does a specific thing. In the new, uh, in the case of Logic Apps, everything is an API app. So all the individual functionalities which are used to from an integration point of view, let's say you want to uh, validate a data or you want to transform a data or you want to uh, decode a flat file or encode a JSON message, uh, everything are available, everything is available as an individual API app and you can use it to go ahead and compose your business process. And there are also a few things, uh, I don't know how much, how many of you have actually went around, played around with it. Uh, in Bistock server, we have the notion of uh, generating a flat file schema from a flat file instance, wherein we, we asked you to go through a wizard and then go ahead and create a schema based on an instance metadata. We have the exact same experience in the Azure portal built in today. So when you go to uh, the validator service or flat file encoder service and try to uh, add a schema, uh, you can either upload an existing schema or you can generate a schema through the Azure portal uh, using the new experience and you can generate it right from the Azure portal. And we also have fine-grained experiences for Bistock rules uh, in Azure as well as training partner management. So hopefully if you have time towards the end of the session, you can go ahead and uh, uh, go through those experiences. If not, I, I definitely recommend you uh, and to go ahead and give it a try and give us your feedback. So what I'll do next is to go through a simple demo scenario. Uh, and it's actually very simple and it's a very uh, common case for integration scenarios where you take a flat file from file share, specifically FTP, uh, mediate it, process it, uh, and then send it to a data store. So in this case, we're gonna take data from FTP, uh, decode the flat file, uh, transform it using a mapper, and then send it to a SQL, uh, a SQL Azure table. But what I'm gonna do is to show you an experience where it makes it the whole process really simple. Uh, so typically, uh, so far in demos, what we do is we create these uh, dependencies. For example, when I, if I have to drop a file in files in FTP location, I need to have that FTP location previously. If I need to create an entry in SQL database, I need to have it previously. So, but what I'm gonna do right now is to show a programmatic experience where you can go ahead and uh, create not only the logic app, but also its dependencies through script. One of the neat things which uh, was released as part of build is that we had a VS SDK version for deploying the logic app templates. The, the, the idea behind it is that you have a Azure resource manager template, which is used to go ahead and deploy your Azure resources. And logic apps and API apps, like any other, any other Azure uh, service out there, is an Azure resource. So uh, what we are gonna do is to see a programmatic experience where we go through the entire process of creating an FTP location, creating a SQL Azure database, and then injecting its data in the, in the, the API app through the script. Uh, so what I'll do is to go ahead and uh, switch to PowerShell. And I'll execute the script and then walk through it in a minute. Uh, so when I run it, what it does is it automatically goes ahead and, and uh, provisions all the necessary resources for me. And the first thing first, we said we are going to insert a, an entry into a database. So it goes ahead and provisions the database dynamically uh, in real time. Uh, and this is primarily for demo purpose. I'm going to give a username and password for this. And once it gets the data, it goes ahead and starts creating the, the resource group and starts deploying a bunch of templates. Uh, I'll go through it in a minute. But if you see the uh, partial script execution, it already shows as it's creating a resource group, it's validating a template, and, and then it's going ahead and creating a SQL server for me, and then creating a, a FTP uh, server for me, and then creating the logic apps, which is required for the demo. So what it does essentially is it, it's a partial script and there is a new partial API, uh, which helps you go ahead and create a new resource group uh, and create a bunch of resources in it based on a template. And what I'll do is go ahead and show you the template. Let me just log in. So if you look at it, this is the SDK which we, we release as part of the build. And this is a template with which the script is executing right now. And there are two parts to the equation. One, we have the external dependencies 
where I had to pick up a data from an FTP server and I had to drop it in SQL. So I'm, I'm using this uh, template, which allows me to go ahead and say, I want to go ahead and create a SQL server database dynamically. And if you look at it, it is an Azure resource. It's an ARM template. So one of the key aspects in this new world is that everything we do is aligned to the overall goal. So there is no stock specific deployment. There's no stock specific knowledge. The way you deploy a stock resource is the same as it, the way you go ahead and deploy any other Azure resource. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and deploy a SQL database and not only create that, but for the demo, we should be able to go ahead and see it in, uh, from the SQL Server Management Studio. So we're going to go ahead and set the firewall rule as well so that we can, uh, you don't have to do, go, ahead and go ahead and do it manually. So all of these can be automated. In, in the same way, you can go ahead and create a website. And the reason I'm creating a website is uh, for demo purposes, I'm going to use the Azure website as my FTP server uh, so that I don't have to go ahead and set up a separate server myself. So this Azure website will act as my FTP server. And once these uh, endpoints are created, like I have my FTP server and the SQL Azure database, I'm going to go ahead and uh, create my actual Logic App resource. And if I, if I will switch, uh, quickly switch, switch over to the, uh, the PPT, here you saw that uh, as part of the flow, we need to uh, take data from FTP, do a flat file encoder, use transform servers, and send it to SQL. Uh, using SQL Connector. Uh, and uh, what we need as part of this is that you need to have the individual API apps for each of these. So I need an FTP API app, I need a flat file API app, I need a transform API app. So that is essentially what the script does. Uh, so if you, if you take a look at it, apart from creating the basic uh, gateway, we are going to go ahead and create an FTP API app. And then we are going to create a SQL API app. And then we are also going to create the other uh, uh, APIs like uh, flat file encoder and transform servers. And uh, right now, you don't have to go to the details of it. Uh, I've already published a, a post in GitHub and I'll send a link towards the end of the session where the script and the uh, way to execute it, its dependencies are already published today in, on GitHub. And uh, we can go through the details of it separately. But the key takeaway, which I want you guys to uh, take away is, when it comes to deploying anything, you should be able to go ahead and do it uh, programmatically. And even in complex cases, for example, previously we created an FTP server, uh, and uh, that FTP server credentials is now injected into this template, and that is through parameters. So when you have the script running, you automatically have the FTP server set up, and we will see it in a minute once the script execution is over. And we also have some advanced uh, capabilities like uh, for Azure Resource Manager. If you go ahead and look at the uh, variable section, you have the notion of packages. If you see packages like flat file encoder and transform servers, it doesn't have any package setting. So when you want to deploy, you don't have to create a script block for each and every API app. Instead, you can use a package, uh, you can define them as an array and then like loop through it to go ahead and deploy. Well, this might sound complex. The main idea behind it is to show that you can not only go ahead and do it uh, through the Azure portal, where you go ahead and create all these things manually. You go ahead and create a resource group, and then you go ahead and create the, uh, the individual de sorry, dependencies. And then you go ahead and deploy uh, the API apps, and then you compose the logic app. You have a lot of manual steps before you actually go to composing the end-to-end -end flow. The idea behind this is to show that you can actually automate all of these through Azure Resource Manager templates and uh, make your life really easy and at the same time make it really reusable so that if you want to do this, uh, the same app from one subscription to another subscription, let's say you're taking it from a, a development environment to a testing environment or from test to prod, you can do that uh, deterministically and whatever changes between one environment to another environment can be captured as part of the parameters. And the parameters can be sent up, uh, given in a separate file, JSON file, which can be uh, which, which can change across different environments. So, so I hope uh, uh, this will help answering some of the questions in terms of how do I take my app from one environment to another. And and I, as I said again, uh, th this particular demo script and template. Uh, it's already available in GitHub, and I'll send a link, and uh, we can go through it later, and you can always reach out to me 
uh, if you have any questions for Victor. So meanwhile, let's take a look at what the uh, script execution is going on. Hopefully, it should be complete by now. So, th so there you go. Uh, if you see the, the resources, let's quickly walk through it. It first uh, cr created a, a SQL server, and then it set up, set up the firewall rule for it, and then it created a website which will act up as my FTP server, and it, uh, it went ahead and inserted a new table metadata into the SQL server, and it deployed the individual API apps required for the demo. So everything is done, and if we now go through, and the name of the resource group is class file demo some zero. So if I go to my Azure portal today, and then go to the resource groups. Let me reload it. I think it's just some. So that resource group is going to contain everything which is required for the demo, including uh, all the API apps and everything else configured. The one key thing which I want to uh, talk about is that now we can actually inject data into the templates, which is really important. For example, in this demo, even though I created the SQL Azure database, if I just connected a SQL connector, I would still have to go ahead and configure the SQL connector to use a SQL Azure database. But because we have templates and because we have the ability to go ahead and provide the parameters, it's already configured for me. So let me uh, just hold on. So while it comes up, let me take a few questions which is there in the, uh, the, the chat window. Uh, all right, so right. I don't think there are any questions per se. So, so the other aspect of it is this, is this templatized version of deploying a logic app or an API app or any Azure resource is gonna be really crucial in terms of defining how we uh, end up taking an app from one environment to another. So what I also have today is a bunch of demos which are specific to this talk scenario, and we can go through it one at a time. But uh, for now, let's start with uh, the uh, resource group which just got deployed. All right, I think there's some network uh, issue. Let me just wait until it loads up. Meanwhile, if you have any questions, just go ahead and type it on the, uh, the browser. I can take it up. It looks like there's still an issue. All right. Realize now it's more coding and more configuring. We are coding. So I don't understand the, the question, so if you can just uh, rephrase it, I think it would be perfect. Mm -hmm. right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and uh, check the resource group which has got deployed. And uh, please bear with me for a minute. It looks like there's some uh, issues here in my console and uh, all right uh, there you go so do you do uh, Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so while this is loading up, I'll also quickly go ahead and okay, so long. So I think there's a question on at what point in time would be able to publish a logic app into the app store. So today the, the marketplace if you specifically is around some of the apps that you have deployed. And if you do create a custom API app, you can go ahead and deploy it in your in your subscription in your resource group. Uh, but we are still working our way out in terms of figuring out how to go ahead and take it and deploy it in and make it available in the marketplace. Uh, we are still working on that. I don't think we have a time frame yet, but I can definitely check back and uh, get back to you. So I would recommend you post this link into the discussion site as well so that uh, we can keep a track of it. So if, okay, I think it's loaded up. If you go ahead and see the partial script, the name of the uh, resource group was Tactile Demo 2 ba uh, something. So let's go ahead and uh, search it. Yeah, here you go. So that, that resource group got created. And what you will see is as part of the resource group, uh, it already contains the resources we need for the demo. Let's see what the resources are. And if you see the API account in the summary page, you already have four API app instances which are required for the demo, as well as a gateway and logic apps. And the actual list of resources show what is already available. But what I want to quickly point out is if you go to a connector, like say SQL connector, or flat file encoder, let's see. This one opens up. All right. The demo bots are not with me today, so hold on. Yeah, it's loading up. For any uh, API app, if you go ahead and uh, look at it, it contains something called an API definition. This shows the list of APIs which you can invoke as part of the API app. And in the designer, it surfaces itself as an action which can be done on top of the API app. So in this case, SQL, uh, normally when you create a SQL, AP, uh, SQL connector, there's, there's no action associated with it because you need to configure and tell which uh, tables you're gonna insert the data into or what uh, sort procedures you're gonna invoke. Uh, but let's try and see as part of the API definition here, uh, whether we are able to automatically see uh, the table which we just created. Uh, so when it loads up, we also have an option, uh, if you look at the top command bar, to download the schema. And this is really important for this talk scenario because when you integrate with LOB data and you need to have structured data coming back and be able to interop on top of it, uh, so we have the ability to go back and say, uh, if you're talking to uh, connectors which want to return metadata, you can uh, also have the ability to, to go ahead and download schemas. In this case, when you want to transform from the FTP flat file structure to the SQL structure, we are using the schemas available here uh, to go ahead and uh, do the transformation. Now, if you look at this, it automatically shows up the API apps based on the table which you just created, the orders, inserts, et cetera. So you don't have to do everything, all these are configured as part of the script. And the same is the case with, uh, uh, hold on, the flat file encoder as well because it will have its API apps installed. And one other thing which might be useful for demo purposes is to have an injection script. So in this case, what I'll do is, I, in the interest of time, instead of going in and configuring everything manually, we already had uh, the exact same script run before and uh, the, the API apps configured. 
what I mean by API apps configured is your ability, for example, if you're using cat file encoder, you want to use a schema against which it's going to decode the data. If you're using transform, you need to have a TRFM file uh, against which it's going to go and use it for transforming the data from one structure to another. So we already done that here. And, and let's see uh, the end-to-end -end flow, which is constructed as part of it. If I go to the resources, uh, and again, if you see, it is the exact same list of API apps and logic apps. So I have this uh, logic app called Flatfile Demo. And, and as part of it, we have composed the same end-to-end -end flow, which we plan to start uh, at the beginning of the session. So, while it loads up, let's, once it's loaded up, we can go ahead and see its uh, definition. Uh, it looks like you're not able, some of the people are not able to hear it. Uh, is everyone able to hear me properly or is it just a one-off situation? All right. So in this case, while the designer is loading up, you see to the right that all the API apps which you created programmatically shows up in the resource group, and it's already configured. And uh, so in this case, we have composed the end-to-end -end flow as well. So we are taking data from uh, the FTP connector, uh, decoding it, uh, transforming the data, and then sending it to SQL. And what happened is we had a programmatic flow, and once we created the API apps, uh, we are able to figure out what the uh, APIs for SQL were, and again, based on the SQL structure, uh, we were able to download the schema, and we created a, a schema and a transform uh, in based on it. I, I know today the SDK is still based on VS2012, and we, we hear, hear your feedback, and we are trying to figure out uh, the ways around it, uh, but in this case, I've used VS2012 to create the uh, schemas and maps, and we have uploaded the schemas and maps as part of the flat file encoder, and uh, uh, transform servers. And now we have the, the app composed end to end. So you have FTP, path file encode, uh, SQL connector. You can also, if you want to see it in one stretch, we also have the uh, designer zoom in, zoom out capabilities. Uh, what I also did is to have a feeder logic app. So instead of going ahead and say, I want to drop a file manually, we also add a different logic app where all it does was uh, inject the data into the FTP server. So this in turn acts as the input data for the other one. So we have an end-to-end -end flow wherein if you want to create a, uh, a solution or a demo or something which is fully uh, self-contained, where you not only create the dependencies, compose the flow, and also inject the input data so that as soon as you run the script, you're all set to uh, like run the scenario end-to-end. -end. Uh, so that was the, the, the idea behind the script. And in this case, uh, we have uh, something called as a feeder logic app, which is another app where all I did was every one minute or every five minutes, uh, we take an input data and then inject it into the FTP connector, which like this serves as input data for the other flow so that you can go ahead and uh, see the flows end to end. So the, and before I switch to some of the other SQL demos, I'll quickly talk about some of the troubleshooting uh, um, tips or uh, helps which we had incorporated as part of the Azure portal. So if you go to the, uh, the flat file demo logic app, every run which gets instantiated, whenever uh, a workflow gets instantiated and it runs, you should be able to see its logs uh, in the operations runs, uh, flow. So when once I uh, open the logic apps uh, file, in this case the flat file demo, you, know, you can not only see its definition, which we saw before, but you can also see its operation. This shows the, all the workflow instances which got triggered, and you can actually go into the details of each one of them. For example, there is one which was triggered a minute back, and you can go to its definition and go to its uh, data, and then you, can, you should be able to see exactly which API apps got triggered and like when they got executed, and the time it took for each API app execution. And what you can also do is you can go to the specifics of each 
individual uh, API. For example, let's say I click on my transform server. I want to know what the input to the transform metadata, transform API app was and what its output is. So you can look at the input link and then it will automatically load up uh, the input to the API app and show the output as well. And this is a key difference between, uh, for example, what we did in the stock services, for example, and what we have right now. Uh, in the stock services, the, the, what we had was a notion of a bridge where there's no persistence in place. Whereas here, uh, since it's a logic app's internal workflow, we actually persist every in, at every stage. Like every input to your API app and every output to your API app uh, is persisted, and you'll be able to see it. And now in the uh, the operations troubleshooting part, you're not a, not only able to see the workflow instance, but also the input and output of each API app in the workflow instance. And I think this is really useful in uh, troubleshooting scenarios. For example, in this case, I'm taking an input XML uh, for the transform server, and you can see the output structure. So, for example, if your transform fail or if something else happens, you can look at the input and then uh, try to feed it uh, to your tests and see if it failed or passed, and then troubleshoot it from there. And I think this is a very good troubleshooting mechanism uh, that is already in place today. And what is also uh, available today is the notion of a trigger history. So, if you go further down and you have a part called trigger history. And if you look at it, for all the triggers which is defined in your workflow today, it shows the trigger history status. Uh, for example, this particular FTP connector is supposed to fire every one minute. So you can see areas where it actually checked for data. There was no files in the FTP share, so it didn't fire the, uh, the workflow instance. Whereas there are cases where there was data in the FTP share and the workflow got triggered, and you can see that uh, when the uh, trigger got fired or instantiated. And this could be useful in scenarios, for, for example, where uh, you put some data in the file share, but the, the trigger hasn't triggered yet. So you can go to the trigger history and check the, the history so they can know when it got triggered and when it didn't. And this is, again, another uh, nice feature which can help you in troubleshooting. So with this said, what I'll do next is to quickly go over some of the BizTalk capability. Uh, let me quickly jump to the PPT and uh, talk about Paragon. So I, I, I personally reached out to a bunch of you, and I think one, one of my colleagues, Kevin, uh, he also reached out to a bunch of people around on the enterprise patterns, um, messaging patterns, security, and a bunch of other scenarios. Uh, if you look at the stock or integration scenarios today, there are a bunch of common patterns, like the ability to do request response or what we had in the stock services is a better, like a simple messaging patterns. Or you want to do content-based routing and decide based on the output of certain action. Or you may do, you want to do execute things in parallel in a scatter scenario. So all these are something which which is possible. To I think it went back to conversation mode. Just give me a minute. And uh, sorry, it keeps stopping between the two automatically. Maybe. All right. All right, so uh, sorry for that. It's just that the app keeps changing automatically, and there is no way to. So we, we do support a bunch of patterns today, and uh, we'll go through some of them. And we are also going to go ahead and make it available so that you can go and try it out soon. Uh, but if, if you are in the app, uh, if you look at the common pattern, uh, like whether yeah, it's okay, data processing or content based routing, we, we are going to be able to support it today. And there are also patterns today which we do not support. For example, uh, there is no correlation. Well, Rajesh, it's just Mike. Um, I think you're having some more problems with that um, meet the presentation mode thing. Wondering if you can flip it into presentation mode again. Yes, so I flipped over it and it automatically changes back to the session mode. Uh, so I can try again. Just hold on. Uh, Uh, 
uh, so, so I'm I'm sorry, ma'am. I tried, but it keeps toggling automatically. There's nothing I can do to uh, do it. Maybe it's I just change compatibility for the app. I don't know. I'm I'm not sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna have a little bit of a um, find out what might be causing that while we continue. But um, if ev everyone who's on the call, if they can just um, press their mute um, individually. So if you bring up the telephone window, there's a microphone button. And if everyone can mute their mic while we're trying to work out what the cause of this is, and that should hopefully solve everybody's um, problems here in Rajesh. But uh, yeah, if you, if you just want to continue for the time being, mate. All right. Um. Uh, right. uh, thank you. Uh, so when it comes to the, uh, the patterns, uh, we do support them. So one of the most common uh, misconceptions is because we stack the API apps together in the visual surface, a lot of people end up thinking that this is a linear flow or a, a linear flow platform. But that's not the case. If you want to do uh, conditional routing or like parallel execution, you can go ahead and do it. In fact, it's an inference-based engine. And the way we go about doing it is every API app has a, a notion of a condition or give its input, and the platform automatically infers, the logic about automatically infers what its dependencies are and stacks it up automatically in the defined surface. So to show an example, let me uh, quickly switch back to the Azure portal. And we have a simple logic app for a content-based flow diagram. And all it does is literally simple. It takes the data from one source, manipulates it, and then based on a condition, it drops it to point A or to point B. Uh, so the way you go about doing it is by adding conditions. And for every API app out there, you can go ahead and add a condition. And the same is the case with a parallel execution as well. But we'll look at it in a minute. very similar to the demo which we just saw, uh, but now we do take a, a content-based routing approach where depending on the condition it routes to point A or to point B. Uh, so, let me proceed to the so now if you see this, uh, the cards are stacked up. We get the data validated and look up a data using XPath and then depending on the data we get from XPath there is the condition return which determines whether the data is routed to the transform server or whether the data is routed to the storage server. And again, you don't have to do anything to lay this out in the designer. And depending on the inputs you have and the dependencies you have, the designer automatically infers it and lays it out properly for you. Uh, I know there is a bunch of feedback in the API uh, the designer. Please keep them coming and it will only help us improve going forward. And uh, so what I also show you is an example of another pattern that is out there which is, let's say, your more traditional stock integration uh, uh, expert and you want to look at the B2B scenarios uh, which is out there today. Uh, and like the stock server, and like the stock server, uh, we do support the B2B stack in uh, Logic App. And uh, what you see is the individual components of the B2B flow. For example, you get the data over AS2 and get the textual data, and then yeah. you want to send it to SQL or SAP. You can still go ahead and do it. Uh, and again, you can look at uh, uh, good messages, bad messages in the interchange, whether you got an MDN or not, or whether you got an acknowledgement or not. And in this case, there's also an important uh, functionality in Logic Apps, uh, which is really useful in uh, integration scenarios, which, which is the notion of uh, looping, uh, repeat. Uh, let's say typically you get EDI data in batches. So in, in a single EDI uh, data, you'll have like 100 transactions. And you want to loop through those 100 transactions and then create individual entries in SAP. So after you process your actual data, you have a bunch of uh, individual transactions. You can now loop over them, like using the uh, repeat transform. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. The loop, you can go ahead and transform it uh, before sending, sending it out, for example, SQL, or you can send it to SAP. Yeah. 
and we do have hybrid support. So let's say if you want to uh, insert an entry into SAP, the SAP can still be on-premise, and if you have the ability to install a hybrid listener, which will route the data to SAP. Uh, so previously, we need a uh, we needed uh, this talk uh, LOB SDK for you to communicate with SAP and other LOB adapters. Now we don't need any of those different things. So all of those licensing headaches uh, 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 go away. And the only thing you require on premise to connect to your LOB applications or any other app on premise is, uh, is like Windows and I. Uh, we install the hybrid listener and then you can go ahead and uh, install the on premise, on -premise LOB application. So in the demos we saw, we saw data integrating from FTP to uh, SQL Azure database, but it's equally possible to take the data and send it to SQL on premise. Your flow won't change at all except to say that I'm going to use a hybrid listener in, uh, in between and put a checkbox, and everything else as part of the configuration is going to remain the same. And this makes it really uh, easy to control hybrid flows. And one need I've been offered is now we can do bi directional flows. So let's say you want to take a data and send it to uh, you can do that. You can also pull the data from SQL on premise and send it to something like Salesforce. Uh, there is also a lot of common integration scenarios where uh, today you uh, get an EDA data sent to uh, SAP and then get the data back and then send it to uh, some other partner. Even though today we do not have an SAP uh, source per se, you can work, it out, work around it by saying that the SAP can send the data to a file share on premise and we can pull a file share on premise and send it to uh, partner or any external data. And this, this is one of the key improvements. Like previously, a lot of things were uh, uh, single directional. Like you can get the data from a bridge and send it to your on premise uh, LOB, but you can't do the other way around. And that, that, that story is way different uh, in Logic Apps platform because you can do bi directional hybrid flow. And this is something which I think would be really uh, useful and critical uh, in the integration phase. You're not able to see the screen? No. Uh, I'm sorry. There's still some background noise. I request the people to go, go ahead and mute yourself because the automatic mute for all participants isn't working. Uh, so, I appreciate you. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so, there, there are a bunch of uh, gaps today as well, so we have a lot of your feedback uh, in terms of saying that uh, whatever be your uh, scenario which is out there today, and you want to go ahead and uh, see it for the end. Mm -hmm. the today. But in case uh, there are blocks or uh, some features which is not there today, we would very much appreciate if you could go ahead and give us your feedback and tell us how it blocks and uh, what features are required. Uh, so we could uh, 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 use part of this, uh, the platform is the marketplace and the community, and you, part of, you make a, a big part. So, if there are scenarios today, please uh, don't hesitate to get back to us and uh, we can take it up from there. So, so at this point, uh, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and uh, stop my sessions and we'll take uh, the question. Okay, so I think the so, so it, it is in the backdrop today. It's one of the most common, commonly asked uh, feedback. Uh, we don't have a time frame for it yet, uh, but I'll definitely take it up and then share an update uh, once we know the specifics. All right. Is there anything else? Yeah, I mean, if you have anything, you can reach out to me. Yeah, I'll put my email address in the. Uh,
Macie, nie 